Welcome to this morning's lecture, Cancer Research Breakthroughs with UChicago Medicine's Dr. Funmi Olapade. And welcome to Alumni Weekend at Home. I'm Colin Hennessy, Executive Director of UChicago Alumni, and on behalf of the entire UChicago Alumni team, I want to thank you for joining us today. Every year, Alumni Weekend is a time to gather, to celebrate our global alumni community, your connections to each other, to campus, and the spirit of continued inquiry and academic exploration. This year, we're excited to bring that same energy to you wherever you may be. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Dr. Funmi Olapade. Dr. Olapade is the Walter L. Palmer Distinguished Service Professor of Medicine and Human Genetics and the founding director of the Center for Clinical Cancer Genetics and Global Health. She is an expert in cancer risk assessment in individualized treatment for the most aggressive forms of breast cancer, having developed novel management strategies based on an understanding of the altered genes in individual patients. Her work focuses on comprehensive risk-reducing strategies and prevention in high-risk populations, as well as earlier detection through advanced imaging technologies. Dr. Olapade is internationally renowned for her expertise in breast cancer, and her research has advanced early detection, treatment, and prevention of breast cancer in high-risk women. A distinguished scholar and mentor, Dr. Olapade has received numerous honors and awards, including honorary degrees from six universities, a 2005 MacArthur Fellowship, commonly referred to as the Genius Grant, and has been named a giant in cancer care for prevention and genetics by Onc Live. And earlier this year, in recognition of her distinguished and continuing achievements in original research, Dr. Olapade was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. Please submit your questions for Dr. Olapade in the event chat box. We will answer questions at the end of her presentation. Dr. Olapade, welcome and thank you for being here. The stage is yours. Thank you so much. And uh, for those of you who are joining us, I, wherever you are in the world, welcome back to class. I'm, uh, and, and I'm uh, joining you uh, from my office in the NAP Center for Biomedical Research uh, uh, and discovery for biomedical research, <laughs> for biomedical research and discovery. So one of the things that really excites me about uh, doing this work and streaming to you uh, is to really be able to share with you what all of the wonderful things are happening on campus and to uh, really tell you that this is summer in Chicago already. Uh, it's uh, almost uh, 80 something degrees today. And uh, for those of you who remember uh, finals week and also uh, going through uh, a, a wonderful day in Chicago, that's what today feels like. Uh, I hope you can uh, see my screen uh, because I'm actually using Canvas and uh, we just did finals for the class uh, yesterday. And they all uh, wrote me back through U of C, really wanted to make sure that they aced the class. And I just laughed. So uh, in preparing for this class, I also asked uh, Colleen to send you papers because um, this year we, uh, uh, I taught two classes to college, uh, uh, in the college and in, at, at Booth. One uh, was uh, the first healthcare, uh, you know, uh, sequence that uh, Booth is trying to put together. And because I serve as the uh, director of the Center for Clinical Cancer Genetics and Global Health, it was really wonderful for me to teach the class with my husband, Shola Olopadi, who is also, uh, who has been recently appointed as Dean uh, for Academic Affairs and uh, does work in, in climate. And so it was really fun uh, to teach both students about how to think about the world, especially in the pandemic when everybody was shut down and all we could do is just really uh, chat with one another. I loved the class. Uh, they were engaged away from all over the world and, uh, and I've signed up to do it again. So for those of you who are looking for a way to reconnect to class, we'll, take, we'll do the both class um, at Glitcher Center next year. Uh, so sign up. And then this, uh, the, uh, the other course is uh, uh, the uh, 
biologic and social determinants of health, which is a completion of a sequence in global health that our biological sciences um, our major uh, students uh, uh, take and uh, they just took the exam. So this is one of the, uh, uh, my final lecture to the class and I broke it down to what is really gonna be accessible, whether you, are, you came as a biological major or you are uh, in finance and business, whatever you learned in Chicago, you know that we gave you that foundation that really allows you to think broadly about complex problems. So I really enjoyed um, uh, being a faculty member here and this is gonna be my 30th year. Uh, this time last year, I told my students that uh, the students were very, very upset. There was a lot of uh, agitation in the class. The uh, students of color were distressed. They all were matching. They could, they, did, they could not focus to do the exam. And we had to spend a lot of time just helping them really finish classes. Because of course, uh, it's a, been a year since George Floyd was murdered. And then the, the significant um, uh, unrest with Black Lives Matter and our neighbors protesting and our students protesting. And then of course, people heard about uh, the, uh, the uh, looting, but what was so wonderful was that everyone really took hold of their neighborhood and our students really stood with our neighbors on the south side of Chicago. The university stood in solidarity with our neighbors on the south side of Chicago. And there's actually no better time to really see the progress that University of Chicago is making uh, in terms of racial equity and also supporting our neighbors on the South side. So I as a medical oncologist, I take care of patients, uh, but I also have a lab and I'm always really thinking about the impact of my work. So the impact of my work has been really phenomenal as I think about myself, uh, this class that I just taught, there were 24 women in the class, all women. And I was wondering why is it that my class is attracting all women. What's happening to the men? So I always had to tell them, it doesn't matter what your gender is or how you identify yourself. We all have to be in solidarity. And so whether you're a man out there, a woman out there, or, uh, uh, or, or not um, uh, uh, sure, just be yourself. And that's what I kept telling my students. And let's really fight for justice for all. So here's what I talk to my patients, uh, my, my students about. So I'll tell you why I tell them about we're all one human race and that we have to be in solidarity. So if you're an anthropologist, if you think about ethnography, whatever your major when you were here, I think we can all agree that in fact, the human race is one. And as a geneticist, uh, I tell them about what I learned growing up in Nigeria, which is really oral history, uh, was that life began in Ileife. For those of you who don't, uh, uh, haven't traveled a lot, uh, Ileife is a small town in Nigeria. And in, just like in Greek mythology, in the Yoruba mythology, which is an oral history I grew up on, um, I, we heard that you know, God came from heaven and just put his staff down and there he was in Ileife. And if you go as a tourist to Nigeria, you're still gonna see that where the original uh, settlers came from. But you know, we now do science, we have mitochondria DNA, and you can think about population, population genetics and the evolutionary genetics that got people to migrate out of Africa. That's much we know that as people migrated out of Africa, then they went all over the world. And so then you have selection that actually allowed people to have different kinds of traits. And so as a geneticist, we can't fix everybody based on genetics. We are always talking about, also thinking about place and because place matters. So I um, also talk about uh, what happened as people migrated out of Africa. And that in fact, when I first I uh, uh, started looking at the international half map data set and, and we were joking that my genetic uh, uh, haplotype was actually closer to that of Catherine Zeta-Jones 
who is so far removed from me. But when we talk about genetic distance, my, I am closer to her than I'm actually uh, uh, close to uh, others who may have migrated in different patterns. But that out of Africa allows us to really trace our ancestry. So then I talk about why should we care about genetic ancestry and place? And then I bring it home because I uh, started off really mapping genes. And then I started looking at you know, what was happening to women, women in science and the gender inequity that actually uh, let us not even study women for decades. Because in those days, uh, until we had a woman as the head of the National Institute of Health, we just didn't know anything about women. Women were uh, thought not to be good research subjects. And so we just didn't study women. But as my career evolved at the University of Chicago, I started studying diseases that impacted women. And this is a global view of cancer because I am a cancer researcher. And while breast cancer uh, is the leading uh, uh, diagnosis all over the world, it's actually not, no longer the leading cause of death because we've done so much to advance treatments for breast cancer. Cervical cancer, which is an infectious related uh, cancer is being eradicated in majority of the world, except in the global South where people are still very poor. When I was in medical school, I told my students that, look, they told me in my Nigeria in medical school that cervical cancer is a disease of poverty. You're poor, you have poor nutrition, you can't really build the immune system that you need to eradicate HPV. And so, you know, experiments in college students said the first time you have sex is when you get HPV infection. And you know, a lot of college students come and that's the first time they have uh, uh, intercourse, but because they are well, they are, have good nutrition, it doesn't become persistent. And that's why we've been able uh, through vaccination to basically be continue to eliminate uh, cervical cancer. And so we talk about cancers that we can actually eradicate by getting people to come out of poverty and to have good nutrition and to then have health and well being. So in my class, we don't talk about disease, we talk about the WHO definition of health, which is not the absence of disease, it's actually that you are well you are thriving and you are enjoying life. And so the whole dimension, but because I'm a cancer uh, uh, expert, I also then tell them about women's health, uh, breast and cervical cancer, and the fact that some of these cancers, uh, lung cancer, stomach cancer, liver cancer, colorectal cancer, many of these cancers that are still killing people, we actually now have what we are calling precision oncology uh, on a pathway to make sure everyone gets screened, everyone gets screened properly, and everyone gets the vaccines that they need. And so while we get, uh, diagnose a lot of breast cancer in the, what I call in the Western world, that's in East, uh, West uh, in America, uh, Western uh, Europe and Australia, uh, the people who are actually dying and having breast cancer as the leading cause of death uh, are in the global South and of course also in Eastern Europe. So why is that the case? And you can see in the Middle East, in the, uh, uh, in the MENA countries, why are women dying? And why is it that these women in low to middle income countries have the highest death rates from breast cancer? What is the burden? And why do they have that unequal burden? So my students get really excited when we begin to talk about global health, because then I bring it home and I say, oh, no, no, no. Global health is actually local health, because if you actually look at some of our neighbors on the south side of Chicago, uh, Blacks have the highest cancer mortality rates in U Chicago Comprehensive Cancer Center catchment area. And we see huge Black-white disparity. So Cook County is where we are. Lake County is Northern Indiana. And if you look at deaths per 100,000, it's one of the highest in the country compared to uh, national averages. And then when we look at that mortality rate ratio between black and white, and you've probably seen it in all cancers, right? 42% uh, more likely uh, 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 for uh, all cancers. And then breast cancer, when I first started my career here, 
it used to be almost uh, 1.9 uh, 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 um, uh, relative risk. But then all of the academic centers in Chicago, we got together. And now after this pandemic, the academic centers are coming together again. And we're talking about Chicago Health Equity Initiative. And that's what we did in breast cancer. We came together and we said, we can't have uh, black women dying at twice the rate of white women in Chicago. So now that rate is down to 1.43. Uh, but look at prostate cancer. Uh, black men, 2.36 more likely to die from prostate cancer. That's just unacceptable. So that's why some of the work we do, colorectal cancer and lung cancer. So some of the work that we do in our comprehensive cancer center is not just thinking out there about a global world, it's thinking about why are our neighbors on the South side dying more, uh, more than they should. And so then we ask, you know, are they getting screened? Should we, you know, uh, you know, my students always talk about, let's get mobile mammography. And I tell them, well, it's not about not having awareness. Let's go to black churches. Let's go and let them have awareness. And I tell them, we actually are doing well in Illinois. I'm so proud to be in a state where we actually know our politicians for who they are, but then we also have activists who light fire on their feet. And so as we get the data, as we show that things are not working in Chicago, you can see compared to US average, we're doing a little bit better. Black women are going in, they get the mammogram. Uh, you know, we have uh, 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 Obamacare or Medicaid expansion, and that allowed more people to have access. But the question that we are now asking is, what was the quality of that access? Did they get access that is of the same quality as we have at the University of Chicago? And we're finding out that perhaps not. So they are, you know, getting mammogram after the age of 50, even higher than whites in Chicago. So what is it then? Uh, well, we see uh, higher rates of obesity and my students talk about food deserts and why there's no disinvestment in, in uh, low income communities, both here in, in, in America and of course globally. And they have a really uh, 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 good fun uh, talking about the disinvestment and why we need to begin to think about what to do when there are no parks uh, and then all the, your, 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 uh, the structural violence in, and the violence in your neighborhood prevents you from uh, uh, walking out. How are you gonna be able to go and walk out and, and, and then we blame uh, your obesity for the fact that you're just there. So we have fun really looking at this data. And then I, I come back to breast cancer and I come back to the work that we had done because by actually really pushing the uh, frontiers of genetics research, which we were able to do because we had community partners. I talked to them about how uh, the uh, former first lady was a uh, 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 vice president for community affairs. And she and I would go to uh, work with pastors uh, in the neighborhoods and we would do community engagement and ask, you know, can we do the studies? And initially when we started, they would say, oh, we've never seen anyone survive breast cancer. And then as we did the work and we showed them what was going on, everybody wanted to participate in our research. And then we were able to move the needle because we were able to show that more breast cancer screening does not always lead to better outcomes. And what we were finding was a, an epidemic of diagnosing breast cancer in white women. And so we talk about overdiagnosis uh, and also overdiagnosis of prostate cancer because there's some cancers that just not gonna affect you. You're just gonna go there slowly. And as you die of other causes, at autopsy, we might find that, oh, you had prostate cancer, oh, you had uh, breast cancer. So those cancers, we can use technology to find them. And so as we did more and more mammogram, we were finding all of these very slow cancers that would never have killed any older women or older men. And then we said, okay, don't get a, a PSA, but then that's the wrong message. Because in fact, there are some women and men who are gonna get cancers that are going really fast. They're gonna go fast like a cheetah. And if you're born and the time that this cancer is gonna uh, uh, grow is really fast and you're gonna now uh, uh, have metastasis, we cannot uh, screen you or try to find this cheetah 
by using the approach of trying to find a snail or even a tortoise, right? So how, where are those pigs of, uh, 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 of uh, breast cancers that, okay, maybe uh, size at which cancer causes death is, is, is slow and we can start screening and pick them up. But certainly what we're doing now isn't picking up these cheaters because we find that a lot of women who come in and had their, you know, followed the rules, followed what their doctor said, maybe they got their mammograms every two years, maybe they got it every year, they still came in with what we call interval cancers uh, due to no fault of theirs. So the genetics is really allowing us to begin to re-stratify. Then of course, who comes to the University of Chicago without thinking about uh, uh, European history? And then I bring them to the idea that we've had written, uh, uh, you know, while my oral history dates this genealogy to Africa, uh, this first paper about inherited breast cancer was published by uh, uh, Paul Broca. And for those of you who are thinking about it, we actually have an amazing center in Paris. And I take, uh, uh, I do a sequence uh, in biology in the Paris center because we do want U of C students who have the opportunity to go abroad to see the world. And then we use that opportunity to go to the, w, to the WHO, uh, to all of the uh, institutions that are actually impacting global health. We uh, uh, take them to London on, on, the, on the train just to see where Jon Snow did his work, how important hygiene was and how transformative the work that Nightingale did. And, how we have to think about interdisciplinary work. And because I'm a doctor, I end up telling them, my job at the end of this class is to make sure none of you go to medical school because you really need to be public health enthusiasts. Because if we can just adopt public health uh, uh, and, and be observ uh, uh, observant, we're gonna make significant discoveries. So that was what uh, a Broca published in the eighties. And then this is what, I published in, 19, uh, in, 19, uh, in 1996, which is this extended African-American family, 34 year old, she developed triple negative breast cancer. This is one of those cheetah cancers. And then of course we blast her with chemotherapy. And uh, of course the chemotherapy of, of worked and she did well because you know, she gained access to research at the University of Chicago. And then she got me to really, I mean, basically transformed my career because she gave me five generations of her family that are from the South and everybody there, you can see an extended uh, pedigree. The, the dark spots there are all the people in our family who have had breast cancer. And then we used that uh, information to actually map the gene BRCA1, we nailed it. And by the time we were able to do the genetic testing, unfortunately, she had had severe heart failure as a result of the drug that we used at that time to treat her breast cancer. And then we knew that if you, she could just take out her ovaries, she wouldn't develop ovarian cancer. But lo and behold, she was, for, she was, you know, she was too sick uh, to go and have a elective surgery to take her ovaries out. And then she subsequently died of ovarian cancer by age 40. So we have fun thinking about, wow, how would you know that you have a risk of a cheetah of a breast cancer? How, how, why, why, what if you, you, you don't feel a lump? This woman felt a lump because she was uh, small breasted, but otherwise, and then this, this, this uh, myth or this, this uh, uh, impression that black people don't want to participate in research Every time we ask our patients, do they want to participate in research? They're like, sign me up. And one of the barriers that we found was that when you don't have diverse faculty, you don't have diverse uh, 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 staff, and you don't engage your patients in research, then of course they're going to be afraid of research. So during the pandemic, we engage with our, uh, our community uh, uh, and, uh, and our hospital was totally converted to a COVID hospital. All of us who were above the age of 60 were asked to sit at home. So I had fun just lecturing all over the world and engaging with scientists all over the world where uh, our young energetic uh, uh, residents went to 
world and uh, and the uh, and our hospital had one of the best uh, 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 outcomes because the, as soon as the patients came, they were able to access clinical trials and we saved a lot of lives. Now, of course, we're hoping that more people uh, get uh, uh, vaccinated. But this woman basically changed my life because I was like, look at all of this publication is about, you know, uh, women of Eastern European ancestry or Ashkenazi Jews. The first 10 papers were talking about Ashkenazi Jews. And then I thought, okay, I'm gonna really uh, figure out the link between triple negative breast cancer and who's getting triple negative breast cancer. So my first uh, postdoc was uh, Dr. Dijon Ho, who is now a professor of public health sciences in the Department of Public Health and now uh, uh, does uh, global health. And I said, let's go and uh, look at every pathology department in West Africa and see what kinds of breast cancer they had. And of course, what we found was that uh, as you go from uh, 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 African ancestry groups, so you can see this pattern is very different. The age that women were getting breast cancer and the people who were dying from breast cancer. So this is now an, a focused uh, 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 attention to look at uh, how breast cancer is not one disease and the rising mortality that is that is being described in uh, the global south, right? So I told you about how uh, we have the highest incidence in America, but look at the mortality. The mortality is actually in this same uh, uh, countries and Nigeria happens to have one of the highest mortalities and also one of the most densely populated uh, 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 countries in the uh, sub-Saharan Africa or in West Africa. So that's really how I started working across the diaspora. And uh, there's a little spot here in um, at the edge of uh, Brazil, and we'll talk about that. But you can see why it's really important to begin to think about uh, data in terms of geography. And uh, is it that you want, we want to diagnose every cancer, or we want to make sure that everyone who is diagnosed with cancer has a chance to survive. And so these women are getting uh, breast cancer at an average age in their 40s, whereas the ones that we're talking about in the US is in, in their uh, sixth decade of life because we screen beginning at the age of 50 and there's a whole tip of the uh, iceberg that is locking uh, below that uh, age. So we then started really thinking about how we would get to the root of breast cancer by studying black women across the diaspora. And of course, you know, the slave trade brought millions of Africans uh, uh, to Af uh, Africa. And then of course, billions uh, across the, what, we, what is called British and French Caribbean. And of course, you also have uh, 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 the Dutch Caribbean, but all the Caribbean islands are filled with uh, vestiges of the slave trade and colonialism. And of course, as we talk about Black Lives Matter, we also have all of us in global health now beginning to talk about the vestiges of colonialism, wherever the British went and the British Commonwealth, whether it's India, wherever it is. So, but the thing that was so different and what is really important and why we're all confronting the sins of the past now is the caste system in every, uh, every country where the whiter you are, the more favored you are in the, in the population. And you can see the uh, why mistreatment of black people all over the world. It doesn't matter who you are. You know, Vijay Singh is a very dark man. He's a black man. And, uh, and so we have debates about is it the color of the sin or is it the genetic ancestry? And they're totally different things. Because for example, in Brazil, you have so much admixture. When we look at what is the proportion of African genes that are in Brazilians, where are those Brazilian supermodels? So beautiful, wonderful skin, beautiful eyes, tall. Where are those genes? Where's the gene pool coming from? So some countries might say, don't even mention black or white. We're all the same. We don't want to talk about the past. But for us as geneticists, we can't understand genetic admixture unless we actually study the population. So this paper was published by 23andMe because people who have money have been trying to say, where did I come from? Where do I come from? 
And lo and behold, there's so many uh, 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 African Americans, about 70% of them, that actually trace their roots all the way back to West Africa. And they trace their roots to Nigeria and the Bite of Benin. Because it turns out that the women who came from this coast were the ones who survived the most. The men, many of them were killed. Many of them didn't survive. If they landed in, 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 the, on the, in, in South America, they were more likely to die. And then as people really started fleeing, then we see the migration patterns towards Chicago, towards uh, uh, the rest of America. And so whenever I come across any patient and I find a BRCA1 mutation, I ask them, okay, where's your family? We're going south. We're going to go do a family reunion. I, I, I met another uh, uh, woman yesterday and we're going to Mississippi because this history of uh, 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 population genetics and population movement is allowing us to find out who has BRCA1 and what can we do about it. So to make a, to cut a long story short, we uh, do a lot of work uh, asking questions about breast tumors from different ancestral populations, whether they contain similar genomic properties. For those of you who are in biotech, you will understand. Uh, those of you who understand science, but what we are talking about is that now we're gone ho about data science. And when we uh, started testing Nigerian uh, women, we did a thousand cases, a thousand controls in collaboration with Mary Claire King and our lab. We published in 2018 young women, predominantly without family history, overrepresentation of ER negative or triple negative breast cancer. Uh, that's the, those are the cheetahs. And this is just telling you that whether you have a family history or no family history, whether we tested you under 50 or over 50, we saw nearly one in eight of those women had a BRCA1 or two mutation. And so we published that paper. And then we, of course, every time we publish from uh, Africa, it's like, how did you do it? They, you must not have done it right. And then we went to Cameroon and we went to Uganda and then we went to Brazil because you know I have this habit. You know I'm a I'm a diehard football fan, and it's not American football. It's like soccer and Pele. For those of you who know the world, the world is all about who's winning in the World Cup. And so as soon as Nigeria loses, then I become Brazilian because all my relatives are in northern uh, Brazil by here. Uh, Lagos, which is the, the city I grew up in Nigeria, is actually uh, the Brazilian descendants who went back to, uh, to West Africa, settled in Lagos, and they brought the Brazilian architecture uh, across the Af uh, Afro-Caribbean beat. This music, the religion that, uh, that Nigerians had, the Yorubas, they, they brought their religion to Brazil. And so in Bahia, you have the Santeria, the Catholic Church actually made Yoruba gods become gods in in uh, become saints of the Catholic Church just to be able to bring uh, the uh, slaves to church. So there's a lot of history, uh, and then of course we compare with African Americans and some of the uh, studies in uh, in white. But I'm giving you the story to tell you how we bring in all the humanities and the history into our class, and but we also are using rigorous science to move things uh, forward. And of course, uh, the paper that was published on 113,000 white women still came to the same conclusion. And this was published in 2021 that we came to in 2018 because we went to the root of breast cancer. And so it's really been wonderful to be at the University of Chicago to have the ability to do high throughput genomic testing and this is for those of you who are mathematicians, you might understand this, but the odds ratio of getting ER negative breast cancer, we have the genes now, and the top genes are BRCA1, BRCA2, PAL B2, P53, ER positive overall. So we can test for these genes now, and then we can test for the whole genome because those who are, have these uh, uh, mutations have very high risk before they turn 40. Okay, so that's why I'm, uh, I'm in a hurry to find everybody before they turn 40 and they are asked to come in to get that first mammogram because they will get breast cancer before they are 40. So if we have the tools, how are we disseminating it 
in the population and why should we disseminate it in the population? So I, I tell my students, you know, I'm the most fortunate researcher because my black patient tell me the real truth. So when everybody would say, well, if you have a BRC1 mutation, I, if I were you, I have your, my breast off and they will look at me and say, Dr. Olopati, I'm not doing that. I, why? There's nothing wrong with me. So they pushed us. And so we started using magnetic resonance imaging. And when we started using magnetic resonance imaging as an option for those who didn't want to have their breast off, guess what we found? We found that it worked. It worked so much better than mammogram. And this young woman already had a cancer developing, but by doing uh, MRI every six months, we picked up her small cancer right there. And so now our job is to take this technology back to the community because technology advances faster than we can use it. And I, it, you know, I've been doing this work now at the University of Chicago since 1991 when I joined the faculty. But it wasn't until 2019 when Beyonce's dad, Matthew Knowles, shared on Good Morning America that he had a BRCA2 mutation. And so now he's the celebrity that I put in my slide. It used to be Angelina Jolie, and everybody would talk about you know, Ashkenazi Jews. But this is even more important for our communities of color, because now we can scale. After the pandemic, everybody knows testing, testing, testing. Without a test, you're not going to know that you have COVID. And so now that we have done this experiment, the next frontier is to now make sure that we can even make it faster, cheaper, and disseminate the benefit of our work. So we have a med clinical need in imaging. Today's one size fits all approach under screens higher risk women and over screens lower risk women. Risk stratified breast cancer screening is a paradigm shift. Large rates of cancer disparities exist, particularly in minority women. We've seen it. Only 6.2% of eligible high-risk women receive a screening MRI. So that technology is there. Uh, and so risk assessment models using deep learning on imaging data are already outperforming traditional models. So how do we use the mathematical sciences and the skill and the amazing work that we can do at the University of Chicago to have global impact? So genomic research in diverse populations should be a priority for precision oncology. We've been talking about it. And, um, and uh, we're now really developing our own risk assessment tool that will be able to actually uh, uh, do better risk prediction in African-Americans. And uh, we can find, uh, you know, uh, just turn overall breast cancer risk and then, uh, 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 and, uh, and then look at uh, the 2% uh, uh, cut off here. So if we use that, we can identify uh, about 5% of women who are gonna be in the uh, 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 highest risk that we can actually intervene before the age of 40. So that's really how, what we're excited about. We have a, a clinical trial that we're doing uh, in collaboration with the Athena Breast Cancer Network. Uh, we're looking to recruit 100,000 women uh, and uh, Athena is uh, all of the University of California schools and now they're coming to the university, uh, they, they brought, come to Chicago to partner with us. And we want, you know, for those of you who are in the audience, get your mom to, to join in or join. Uh, it's wisdom, uh, 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 wisdomstudy.org. You can join. Any woman over the age of 40 uh, can join with no prior history of breast cancer. And then we also, uh, of course, have uh, the, uh, our own uh, Chicago Alternative Prevention Study for high-risk women. So uh, lastly, uh, you know, this is uh, a, a company that I uh, co-founded with my daughter and a Booth student to really get people to have point of care counseling, get the, your test done, and then refer to a genetic uh, specialist and that there should be one in every practice. So we're there, we're talking about cancer interception. Now this is the American football where you don't want cancer to touch down you just want to intercept it by really uh, doing risk assessment in every patient. So that's it. Uh, we're really, uh, you know, really excited about precision healthcare and precision oncology care because now we've all been doing telehealth. We can do consultation all over the world. Uh, we can do uh, targeted screening, targeted interventions, 
targeted prevention, nutrition, exercise, yoga, so many things we can do that's non-medicinal to keep all of us uh, well. And then of course we can do accelerated biomarker uh, uh, clinical trials. I'm excited about possibility of using uh, real world data. So there's you know, convergence now in terms of our thinking that our immune system can be revved up and that a lot of the things that we need to target probably be, is part of the, uh, what, I, what we are and then the exposure that we, we get. So I will end by uh, saying that I'm really enjoying myself at the University of Chicago. And I want to thank everyone uh, in the audience, especially the alums who continue to uh, uh, support us and donate uh, to uh, allow me to have this amazing team. So this was um, uh, Fe February 14th, the entire breast program, we came together. And these are all students, uh, University of Chicago students who uh, were uh, in the lab and my uh, other professors who are my colleagues. It was our last time to get together before the pandemic. And so I will treasure this uh, diverse uh, 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 students and faculty and postdocs that uh, took this picture on February 14th, uh, 2020. And then we shut down. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Olohade, for that, uh, that talk. Every time I hear you speak, I learn so much new things about your, your amazing work. And uh, it's, I could just listen to you for hours. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. We've got a number of questions from the audience that I hope I can go through with you. I know they value your thoughts. Um, I'm gonna start off with one uh, that feels very timely because it's related to COVID. Uh, there's, a, there's a question about if you're seeing any impacts on screenings for the work, for the breast cancer work that you do um, related to COVID and how we might be able to address if there's a delay in people getting screenings or, or just, you know, how COVID's playing a role and what you think is a oh, good way yeah. to use it. I mean, COVID, COVID has really devastated uh, the uh, oncology community. One, because number, uh, when we shut down and we couldn't open the uh, uh, hospital, a lot of uh, tests, a lot of diagnoses were delayed. Uh, but the good thing was that we actually really were able to get uh, in, everybody in the lab sent all their uh, PPE to the hospital. And so the oncology floor remained open. So our patients did not have to not be treated. And so we immediately wrapped up. And they, but it was the, the fact that patients did not want to come. Mm -hmm. They couldn't come. They were afraid of the hospital because they were seeing that the hospital had been taken over by COVID patients. And so, uh, of course, having knowing that it all, what it took was washing your hands and all that, we quickly ramped up. So by June last year, we had done a lot more telemedicine and then we had distributed where our patients could get chemotherapy. Uh, but we lost patients who, because they couldn't get access. And now that we've opened up, uh, people are still reluctant to come back in and then we have a backlog of people who didn't get their uh, uh, their MRI and so now that's why we're actually uh, speeding up uh, risk assessment because if you have high risk if you have a family history we want to put you to the top of the line and then really ramp up uh, within the hospital here and throughout our, our network and it's wonderful remarkable the, the job that the um, the city has done to really open up. Our lab has been open. We do rotations and the hospital has been open, but patients are just still very reluctant to come. Yeah, hopefully we'll see that continue that, you know, people coming back and, and getting that, that treatment yeah. that they, they need in those risk yeah. assessments. You, you've talked about um, assessment risk, genetic testing and so forth. Is that genetic testing for you know, the breast cancers and so forth that you're talking about, those markers and so forth, is that readily available certainly at the University of Chicago and, and, if, and also at other academic medical centers? Like, is this a unique offering here or is it something that's actually a little bit more widespread given yes. your work? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. So I uh, chaired the American Society of Clinical Oncology Task Force in 1996. I wrote a paper in the New England Journal because it was so clear to me that you know, if you're gonna have a cheetah of a cancer, you wanna know about it. 
But you know, people were reluctant because, oh, your insurance company is going to discriminate against you. You know, oh, you, you know, you don't have insurance. What are you going to do if you know about it? And uh, and it was really interesting that uh, Gilda Radner died of ovarian cancer. So there were many ovarian cancer uh, advocates who said, look, I would rather know that I have a risk for ovarian cancer. And so we worked with rabbis, just like we worked with pastors on the, on the south side of Chicago. And we were able to really make it compelling that anyone with a family history, that was how we started it, could gain access to genetic tests. The, the rate limitation was that there are not enough genetic counselors, yeah. right? And so as oncologists, we actually said, look, we give people bad news all the time. If we tell you you have a you were born with a mutation, that's not bad news because we all are born with something or the other. And so what we need to do is to help you mitigate that risk. And that was why since 1996, we've been really training every oncologist in this country to understand that every cancer patient should know why they got breast cancer, why they got colon cancer. And as long as we have some people who got cancer because they have inherited a genetic mutation, then you, the onus is on you to talk to their family member. So every family member should be assessed. And we did that for the last 20 years. And now because the test is so cheap, people are going to 23 and me and they say, oh my goodness, I just did this because I wanted to know my ancestry. And guess what? I have this mutation. And then they'll say, what do I do about it? So that's why I said, well, if doctors are not asking you to do it, you ask your doctor, sure. right? Because now if you are African-American, you shouldn't wait till 50 to get your first mammogram when you're going to die before 40. And that's been the excess death. If you are Latina, we found that in Chicago, while we were able to reduce the, uh, the, uh, the disparity because older uh, uh, black and white women were going in to get mammograms, the disparities with the women under 40 who are coming in because they nobody even when they show up to their doctor, the doctor will say, oh, just like in Nigeria, oh, well, you just had a baby. It's nothing. Don't worry mm -hmm. about it. Young women don't get breast cancer. So that's why in my class, I tell everybody, go and call your mom right now <laughs> and tell them, you know, to have risk assessment. And for men, go and uh, do your risk assessment because this also has implication for prostate cancer. Sure. It turns out BRCA1 and BRCA2 is the number one uh, uh, gene that you can test for, for prostate cancer. And, uh, and the men are now telling, oh, we, we want the, and say, I've been telling you that for 25 years, <laughs> right? The women should have just been be listening. <laughs> right? The women have been out there because they, they are saying, I don't want my daughter to go through what I went through, right? Yeah, so yeah. we need our men to, to, to get it together and come with us. We should get a t-shirt that says, get it together <laughs> and come with us, right? Um, you've touched on something that, that you know, has certainly popped up several times in the questions. And, and I think people would, would love to hear that ideal age that people should start screening for breast cancer. You've just commented on that, like 40, 50 is, is too old. You know, yeah. when, when do you think people should really start getting these screens? Yeah, so just like we talk about, so in that class, we actually talk about every woman every child, every adolescence. That's sort of a strategy that the United Nations and the WHO have actually put together. You know, we've had a lot of poly, uh, policies to improve women's health, right? To in, improve gender equity, to make sure women are supported. Every dollar you spend on a woman, she spends it on her family, right? So if our strategy is to get family if people get married, that's fine. If they don't get married, but, and we say every woman, every child, every adolescent. So as this uh, uh, vaccinations are getting rolled out, we want every, by the way, I didn't even talk about HBV associated head and neck cancer, right? It's one of the fastest growing cancers in men because men also get HPV infection. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in the ideal world, we will vaccinate both men and women. And we're asking that girls get vaccinated before the age of 11, right? And so you can begin to have that conversation with your adolescents. You know, as girls are becoming mature, 
right? Gender uh, 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 equity, sexual violence. Those are some of the things we talk about in class. And sexual violence, everybody wants to protect girls from sexual uh, violence, but maybe you should also talk to them about what they can do to prevent pregnancy. So we talk about the fact that the number of, uh, you know, when I ask the, the students, which is your favorite sustainable development goal? They all pick education. Mm -hmm. If you keep girls in school, the longer the education attainment, the less likely they are to have teenage pregnancy, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why this conversation has to be throughout life. We talk yeah. about breast health. We talk about vaccination to prevent HPV. And then during that time, they should be aware that as long as they have br breast, what is their breast cancer risk, sure. right? And if they know their breast cancer risk, then we talk about controlling your weight, breastfeeding, so many things that make women and children prosper and are well. We talk about their mental health, right? Women are the most uh, are caregivers. I talk about if you're going to uh, uh, get and you know partner with anybody make sure you have a partner that supports you right so that's what we talk about in class gender equity and supporting one another in solidarity so yes the answer is by 21 every girl should know uh, should already have their vaccination and should already know what to do about their breast cancer risk that's great. Thank you. A question that's come up is, uh, you know, looking for your feedback on any promising research at the university regarding using mRNA technology to treat cancers. Yeah. So, of course, uh, you know, the mRNA technology was being developed for cancer, right? And then everything got put into warp speed for uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. And we're just, I mean, this is the best that biotechnology has had. Uh, in this past year, right? So all of those technologies are now going to be deployed after this pandemic. You know, the, we now know, for, for example, that the immune system is so critical, right? Some people are, are, are studying how to rev up the immune system, right? How we know the pathways, we know uh, how to target the tumor and microenvironment. For lung cancer, that used to be one of those deadly cancers, and by the, by the way, the number one cancer are for women. We now know that you can target it or we have clinical trials that are actually only just using immunotherapy without any chemotherapy. So in the era of precision medicine, it's not about how many uh, drugs you combine together. It's about the diagnosis, molecular mm -hmm. diagnosis. What, do, what is this cancer going to respond to and then how do we target it? So it's really very exciting. So yes, all the mRNA technology is going to get uh, uh, di diverted. And that's why, you know, the President Biden is put together a focus on building back better. And we're going to get more money at the NIH, I hope, uh, because it's been underfunded for a very long time. And then cancer is, is and cancer and neurosciences, uh, really, we, we're all aging and we have to address some of these uh, problems. Yes. So I've got one last question for you. And actually, you just mentioned lung cancer, and that's where this question kind of touches on. You, you, you commented on how it's such a prevalent cause of death. Um, and the, the question kind of gets to have geneticists like yourself found genes that are responsible for it? And if so, is lung cancer risk testing available in ways that may be similar to what you've described for some of the Absolutely. Perfect question. The reason why we, I talk about women's health in my class is because when women lead, then men follow. <laughs> and women are the po po purveyors of, of uh, healthcare. And so what we have found is in every cancer type, there's genetic testing available. What is actually even amazing is that because women started smoking when they became liberated, right? It's mm. the part of keeping your weight down and smoking. We now find that, that there are some women who actually never smoked and developed lung cancer. And now we're learning that you can actually screen uh, for uh, lung cancer. We have low dose CT, just like I talked about MRI. We now have low dose CT and we can combine genetic testing plus your history of tobacco. This is why where the 
gene environment really matters. If you don't smoke, even if you have the gene for tobacco, uh, tobacco addiction and uh, to get lung cancer, you will not get lung cancer. If you have a BRCA2 mutation, you have a risk for pancreatic cancer, but you don't smoke, you will not get pancreatic cancer. So we're tying in what I call preventive oncology. Let's find all those ex-smokers and begin screening them. Let's get all those women who worry about their weight and started smoking. If we can get them to stop uh, smoking, we will do a lot to lower deaths from lung cancer. That's great. Thank you so much for, for answering all those great questions from the audience. And thank you for sharing a glimpse into your research with our audience. Your work is so inspiring and, and truly at, at the forefront uh, of medicine. Uh, I also wanna thank our audience for joining us today for the kickoff of Alumni Weekend at Home. We hope you'll continue to tune in for other Alumni Weekend events, including Dean John Boyer's On Common Core lecture today at 2 p.m. Chicago time the conversation with incoming University President Paul Alvasados tomorrow at 10 a.m., IOP Live featuring David Axelrod in conversation with representative and law school alumni Liz Cheney, Big Brains Live with multi-degree holder Pat Brown, the CEO of Impossible Foods, and many more events and programs. From connecting with friends and classmates to engaging and captivating content like the conversation we just had with Dr. Fumi Alapade, Alumni Weekend at Home has something for everyone. And don't forget to stop by our virtual quads and visit some of your favorite places on campus, including our pop-up shop where you can get some of your favorite UChicago swag. Until then, thanks for joining us and have a great day. All right, thank you. Bye-bye.